Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. For all of the sneering, snarling, and apoplectic rage directed towards vaping in the public sphere, behind the scenes, there's a sober, sinister scheme underway intended to destroy the fundamental science that supports vaping as a tool for harm reduction. Joining us today on RegWatch is Dr. Leon Shahab, one of the world's leading researchers in smoking-related diseases, cessation, and biomarkers. He holds three master's level graduate degrees in neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, and physiology, and his doctorate is in health psychology. Dr. Shahab is an associate professor of behavioral science and health at the Institute of Epidemiology and Health at University College London. Most of us know that smoking is bad for our health. In fact, it's the biggest preventable cause of death in the country. Over 3 million people currently use e-cigarettes. However, there are still lots of misconceptions around their relative safety. I'm here with one of the country's leading stop smoking experts who's going to carry out an experiment to show the impact of smoking conventional cigarettes compared to e-cigarettes. And what we are going to do is we are going to have one bell jar set up to smoke the average number of cigarettes smoked by a smoker each month. And then we have another bell jar through which we draw vapor from an e-cigarette for the same amount of time. And here is the bell jar with cigarette smoke. I mean, it just is so revolting. Look at this, that's just the inside of the jar. Here, a lump of tar. So that's what's going on inside your lungs. So is this what's happening inside our bodies when we smoke? It's certainly a good indication. So now let's have a look at the e-cigarette. Let's just see. A little bit of vapour. That's the only one that's really got much in the way of colour. Just feels yes. wet. My research shows that e-cigarettes are significantly less harmful than cigarettes. A big reason for this is the tar, which you can see here, which is not produced by e-cigarettes, but produced by cigarettes. So this experiment shows that every cigarette you smoke causes tar to enter your body, and it's the tar that contains the poisonous chemicals that spread through the bloodstream. Which are linked to diseases such as heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Dr. Shahab, thanks for joining us today on RegWatch. And thanks for having me. Well, look, right off, there's so much to talk about. What do you make of the hysteria going on in Canada and the US? Well, either I think this represents a genuine case for concern for vaping or there's something else going on. And as I mentioned, uh, my background in part is an epidemiology and as an epidemiologist, I think it's highly likely that it's the latter, i.e. that there's something else going on. And the reason we know this, I think, is because there are already 40 million users worldwide who have used e-cigarettes for over a decade with no previous incidences of these so-called vaping lung diseases. And one could argue, of course, that uh, this the fact that they only come out now is because they were missed earlier, not recorded. But that seems quite unlikely because in most places, including, for instance, in the UK, we have notification schemes in place to protect the public. So the UK Medical and Healthcare Products Regulation Agency has a yellow card scheme where people can report any kind of adverse events. And given there are about 3 million users in the UK, since 2016, there have been less than 100 cases reported of any kind of adverse events, none of which were what we would call a vaping lung disease. So it's unlikely it's just been missed so far. Um, what is more interesting really is in this particular event, it seems that it's pretty localized to the North American context. As you mentioned, it's in Canada and America, with most cases sharing quite a lot of specific characteristics. And the characteristics appear to be these are younger users. They're people who have used cannabis-related products, for instance, uh, tetrahydrocannabinoil, or THC as it's called. And they're often obtained by the sounds of it uh, on the black market. So there might be bootlegged or illicit substances involved. When you just say it, that so matter of factly, there was quite a bit of time though, at the very start of this whole outbreak where CDC and even FDA, but mostly CDC, was not so clear about uh, the THC. I mean, from you guys over there, that's obviously got a you know different kind of a view of what happened sure. here. Was it yeah. clear that they were not being truthful? 
Well, I think that uh, in this particular instance, linking e-cigarettes in general to these deaths, so not just you know a particular substances that may be used in the e-cigarettes, but just e-cigarette use in general without the proper context uh, is quite misleading. Um, and unfortunately, this will have unintended consequences. So um, it may lead, for instance, people who have stopped uh, smoking using e-cigarettes to stop vaping and maybe go back to smoking. Um, in particular, when you know when there's this kind of this this uh, uh, debate around whether they are less harmful or you know more harmful than cigarettes. In the UK, for instance, we have seen that even before the latest incidents uh, of this reporting of vaping lung diseases in the media, there has been an uptick in the number of smokers who believe e-cigarettes to be as harmful as smoking. But 45% in the UK now already believe they are as harmful as smoking, and a further 15 percent think it's more harmful. So that's quite worrying. And if, uh, you know, uh, public uh, officials report e-cigarettes to be the cause of these deaths rather than providing more context, I'm sure this is quite misleading and will have these unintended consequences. Dr. Shahab, so you've got a lot of research that you've been working on, tons that I was going through. Uh, with Cancer Research UK, you recently released a study called e-cigarette safety, uh, in which is the first comprehensive study on extended long-term vaping. Is that right? That is correct, yes. So Cancer Research UK funded me to conduct a study where we looked at the long-term, the, the exposure of long-term users of e-cigarettes to harmful substances and compared them with the exposure uh, to these substances in cigarette smokers and users of nicotine replacement therapy. And what we find is, is that people who use e-cigarettes have much lower levels of harmful substances that have been linked to subsequent disease. Reductions that we see are between 80 to 95%, uh, and the levels are similar to what you see in people who are using nicotine replacement therapy, so medicinal nicotine, such as nicotine patch, nicotine gum, which have been around for 30, 30, 40 years now, and which are known to be safe, which is quite reassuring. Let's take a look at uh, an article that came out today, and we would call this suspect science at RegWatch, and that's exactly what we'll be titling it when we curate it to the website and take a look here. It says, vaping for long periods of time could increase the risk of cancer, studies suggest, and right underneath it, illness and deaths linked to vaping continues to increase. And a perfect example, are you talking about vaping of nicotine? Or are you talking about vaping of THC? Uh, you purposefully have to know when you're when you're headlining this, you know what the truth is. Yeah, no, exactly. And I would suggest, you know, uh, the recent spate of vaping lung re lung, vaping lung related diseases uh, really uh, show that what is the problem is not the action, i.e., vaping. You know, using standard e-cigarettes has has been shown to be safe, and we have millions and millions of users. But it's what is vape that's the problem. Um, and it's likely that some of these products may require, you know, some of these products that they used uh, in the case in the U.S., for instance, using THC, is that they use different solvents, because unlike nicotine, THC is not really easily water soluble. And if the wrong uh, oil-based solvent is used, then of course it can affect your lung function. If these are many bootleg products, who knows what's going on in these underground labs? And uh, it's impossible to know what other adulterants have been added, but it's likely that it's the adulterants rather than standard e-cigarette products which are causing these lung lung diseases. Vaping for long periods of time could increase the risk of cancer, study suggests. New research on a small cohort of mice has suggested that long-term exposure to vaping liquids that contain nicotine could increase the risk of cancer. In a bid to find out whether or not vaping really is a safer alternative to smoking, scientists from New York University conducted a study on 40 mice in which animals were exposed to e-cigarette vapor for a year. First, the, you know, right off the bat, we should point out that IARC, so the International Agency um, on Research in Cancer, which is the standard agency, um, does not classify nicotine as carcinogenic, as is implied in this particular uh, uh, article. And this is because over decades and decades of research, nicotine has not been shown to be carcinogenic to humans. Um, there are some studies that suggest there may be carcinogenic in certain circumstances in animals, but humans and animals, I mean, humans and mice, rodents in particular, are quite different. Um, I mean, animal research, I'm just to go a bit broader on this and then specifically talk about this particular paper. Uh, animal uh, studies are, of course, quite helpful, but they have always their own problems. So that's a good starting point. Um, so certainly they're not trying, you know, they're not very helpful when we're trying to evaluate quite complex behaviors. And arguably vaping or smoking are quite complex behaviors. We can't get a mouse to actually smoke or vape. And so what people do is they set them, put them into a cage and they fill the cage with either smoke or vapor. Um, and that is already 
right of the button problem because uh, the way that it's inhaled will have an impact. As one example, if you uh, if you inhale more deeply into the lung because you include perforations on cigarettes, you find that actually people develop cancers in completely different locations. Now, a mouse won't be able to do that, so it's not particularly ecologically valid to look at, for instance, locations of tumors. But it's more, it's uh, very difficult to calibrate the exposure level. So mice will, for instance, lick deposits of their fur or the surface. Humans wouldn't lick a surface, so they probably get even more out of it than, than a human would do. Um, so likely exposing them to more harmful substances. But uh, more importantly, I think there are physiological differences. So um, mice, for instance, are much more sensitive to nicotine. Um, and so some of the results that we see in studies, including this one, are likely to be the result of nicotine poisoning. In fact, in this particular study, some of the mice died during the exposure levels, right? So they're exposed to far more, far higher levels of vapor than a human would be. Uh, a colleague of mine tried to work out what it is, and they're basically calculated they're exposed to 450 years of vaping in just a year. And that tells you something about the fact that these are quite unrealistic use conditions that need to be taken into consideration. Is there an epidemic of vaping in the U.S.? Not as far as I can see. If you look at uh, the adolescent rate of e-cigarette use uh, among never smoking uh, adolescents who use them regularly, we know around 1% use them. So it's unlikely that this would uh, constitute an epidemic. So the 70% number that we hear from, uh, you know, former commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb and CDC and everything else. I mean, that's just one way of looking at the data. Well, that's one way of looking at it when you just measure if kids have ever used an e-cigarette, which clearly doesn't represent, you know, an epidemic uh, in the sense that, you know, they're using them regularly. In fact, kids who use e-cigarettes, most of them haven't used them more than 10 times in their whole lifetime. So that's unlikely to be an epidemic. So if there's no epidemic of teen vaping, and let's be clear with our audience, we're talking about traditional nicotine vaping that's legal in Canada. And of course, in the U.S., you know, all the ingredients have been sent in and there's a process there that that's all being legalized too as well. Well, so if that's the case and there's not an epidemic, uh, is the hysteria justified? Well, clearly it isn't really, because um, if if we consider the fact that people are worried that kids use an e-cigarette and go on to go smoking, this clearly can't be justified given that we know that over the same time period that e-cigarette use even not regular e-cigarette use has increased cigarette smoking rates have decreased quite dramatically in the U.S., what about the CDC then in the lung illness? Because there clearly was an effort, I would say, to connect traditional nicotine vaping to the lung illnesses. We see it still being done in the media today. Is that part of the hysteria? I suspect it is. And I think it's part of a general quite misleading way of presenting some of the science that is occurring in, in our field. So linking e-cigarettes to these deaths without any proper context, I think, is very misleading. Unfortunately, we'll have consequences for people who are using e-cigarettes at the moment who are starting to feel that these are as harmful as cigarettes when clearly they're not and therefore may go back to smoking and therefore may die because of smoking related diseases. Is it fair to say that this lack of information could have caused more exposure, more illness and potentially deaths? It is possible as a scientist I have a whole judgment whether <laughs> this is actually the case. Obviously, if we think there's some kind of uh, adulterants being used that have caused the lung disease and it's not made clear that it's not e-cigarettes in general, but the fact that there are adulterants being used or that particular uh, cannabis-related products being used that are bought Ill uh, illegally, which, which are the problem, then if you don't make the public aware of it, then clearly they won't necessarily stop do using these products. And so it's important to, uh, to identify the actual cause of these vaping lung diseases. By not doing so and by linking it to general e-cigarette use, you will dissuade people who are using standard safe e-cigarettes from using them and go back. they might go back to smoking, which would be terrible. Now, could that not actually be a public health disaster? It, it could be, it could very well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yes, yes, I would agree. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, I know it's hard to, it's hard I to mean, put your head around that because this is public health. They're, yeah. they're, and they know the same thing that you know deeply. Is there, a dis is, I, is there a dissonance for you to have to think about that, that your colleagues actually could be so treacherous? Uh, well, uh, if they are uh, willfully misleading the public, that is that would be quite shocking. And I'm, I am trying to, you know, think about why why this is or why, you know, what causes people to claim against better evidence being available that e-cigarettes are, you know, A, producing epidemic or B, are uh, harmful, as harmful as cigarettes when they 
you know, would have to know that this can't really be the case given very simple uh, considerations, uh, including the fact there's no combustion going on. It does surprise me. I would just argue, really, that uh, maybe in the UK, uh, we look at the cold hard facts. And so one cold hard fact I can give you in relation to this uh, recent spate of lung disease is that Yes, it's unfortunate, in particular that kids uh, uh, die, um, and I think the numbers were 18 kids have died, and there are about a thousand cases. Um, but if you look at the quarter facts and you look at public health uh, at population level, over the same time period, so last two months, about 75,000 smokers have died in the USA. And equally, over the same time period, there were 21,000 people affected by eating contaminated food and 500 deaths just due to eating contaminated food. Now, nobody would argue, therefore, we have to, you know, ban all food. You just have to, you know, take a reasoned, reasoned approach to the fact that it's likely there's some kind of contamination going on, some kind of adulteration in some of these products. But by comparison, it is, it is I think, very clear to me, anyhow, if you look at public health outcome on the whole, is that, you know, smokers are the people that we have to help. And they tend to be older, it's true. I don't think there is so much of an epidemic as people make out uh, there to be in the US, for instance, when it comes to teen smoking. So I can give you some figures on, if you want me to. Please. Okay. Uh, because I, I think that is, that is something that is uh, to do with this whole uh, discourse, you're quite right, about the fear that you know there's a whole uh, generation now of kids being addicted to nicotine in the US. And... If you want to answer the question whether there's an epidemic, you really have to ask, you know, how do you measure e-cigarette use? So if you think about ever use, yes, a large proportion of adolescents have tried e-cigarettes, about 40% in the US, I think. But if you drill a bit further into the data, it becomes quite clear that we, the kind of use that we're really most concerned about, which would be use among, among kids who have never smoked and regular use, i.e. weekly or daily use, um, is very small. It's still at around 1%. So it's very low. So I wouldn't call it an epidemic. And what's more is if you ask those kids, who are using e-cigarettes, you know, to find out whether they're addicted to it or not. Uh, do you have cravings for your e-cigarette or would you use an e-cigarette within 30 minutes of waking? 4% say yes. 4% of those kids that, you know, the, the few kids that use e-cigarettes regularly anyhow. And in fact, about 60 odd percent of kids who say they have used e-cigarette and e-cigarette uh, have used it in less than 10 days in their whole life. So it seems as clearly overstated the whole epidemic that is uh, being, you know, the idea that's being propagated in the U.S. Then that's U.S. stats. I was just going to ask that. So how fresh is this analysis? Is this 2019 stats? Uh, this is data, I think, from National Youth Tobacco Survey, uh, which was uh, recently put out by colleagues of mine here at UCL, which looked at data from 2014 to 2018. Um, but the latest data, for instance, if you think about the concern that e-cigarette use will drive up cigarette smoking later, the latest data show that, e that cigarette consumption or cigarette prevalence among kids has declined even further in 2019, uh, which sort of uh, puts the whole idea of a strong gateway effect to rest, as far as I can tell. Because, you know, if there's a gateway effect, I'm not quite sure how long one has to wait for it to translate into extra population data. And the population data do seem to suggest that over the same time period that e-cigarettes have become more popular among, among adolescents, cigarette consumption, cigarette prevalence has continued to plummet. And it's now, I think, at the lowest rates has ever been recorded. So all the discussion then about gateway, so starting with an e-cigarette and moving to a cigarette, that might not be the right metric here. We should be thinking of it as a barrier. Yes, I mean, e-cigarettes can also introduce, I mean, it's entirely possible that uh, somebody who's, who uses an e-cigarette when they come into an environment where they normally would have smoked a cigarette would not pick up a cigarette, but instead use the e-cigarette. And so they would be prevented from becoming a smoker, which sort of makes sense if you think about the fact that, you know, cigarettes stink and smell, they're quite expensive, and they're also not considered to be anything that's very cool anymore because they're much less popular uh, than they used to be. And so it is, it's only one side of the story to say that there might be a gateway from e-cigarettes to cigarettes. It's also possible there's a gateway away from smoking if you use an e-cigarette. And uh, the data, population level data, certainly would not suggest there's a strong gateway to smoking given that smoking prevalence has decreased while e-cigarette use has increased. One of the biggest complaints or, or attacks is the fact that there's no longitudinal studies. There's no long-term studies. And that, and that attack is so prevalent and s runs so deep, it's actually burned into the public's mind. Any Joe public, when you bring up vaping like this or whatever, they're like, well, there's really not enough long-term studies on that. We don't really know, right? And so how does your research 
a, you know, challenge that. Okay. So, I mean, first of all, as a, as a, you know, as a first point of refuting the kind of the argument about, you know, there not being any kind of long-term evidence, we do, in fact, have some long-term evidence now insofar as people have been using it for over a decade. And as I mentioned before, people long-term, by the way, this is something I didn't mention about the lung uh, diseases that are related to vaping. These are all acute events. They don't appear to be chronic events. And when you think about long-term effects, you're talking about chronic effects and chronic events. Um, and there hasn't been, given the number of uh, millions of uh, e-cigarette users, we haven't seen any kind of uh, increase uh, in reporting of particularly diseases that are chronic associated with vaping. Uh, the other thing is, just if you don't know anything at all, just, you know, uh, basic chemistry at high school level or whatever, we know a priori already that cigarettes have to be much more harmful because cigarettes combust, they burn things. And there are about 700 or so uh, chemicals, constituents in tobacco, which are turned to about 7,000 when you burn them, including 70 known carcinogens. And you burn them at 800 degrees and that is always gonna be bad for you. By comparison, e-cigarettes contain relatively few components, including propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, nicotine, um, and flavorings, and they are not burning anything at all. So they've warmed up to 250 degrees Celsius. So even if you don't know anything else about it, you have to say that everything else being equal, ceteris paribus in Latin, they should be less harmful. Um, now, one thing that we can do in order to work out likely long-term effects is to look at what are called biomarkers, uh, and these are basically the byproducts of your body ingesting something, including, for instance, cigarette smoke or vapor, and then it interacts with it and breaks it down. So you have a metabolite, and you can look at the level of metabolites in users of different products. Uh, one of these metabolites that is very well characterized is called NNAL, which is a nitrosamine, which in long-term studies has been linked to the development of lung cancer. And what you can then do is, without having to wait for 20 or 30 years, you can now already look at the kind of substances in the body of a user and see whether they're present at the same level as you see in cigarette users. And what we found in our study is that when you compare and look at these particular harmful substances, they are reduced by about 97% compared with somebody who's a cigarette smoker. And there are, they have levels of exposure that are similar to that what you see in users of nicotine replacement therapy, and we know nicotine replacement therapy is relatively safe. In fact, a colleague of mine tried to estimate the cancer-causing, uh, 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 no, what do you call it? carcinogenicity, essentially, of e-cigarettes, and he estimated it as about 1% of the carcinogenic uh, potential of, of cigarettes. And so we now know already that it's highly unlikely that uh, e-cigarettes are likely to cause you know, lung cancer in the same way that cigarettes have done in the long term because we have studied it in humans who use them long term and we can see that these biomarkers are much, much lower. Does any of these uh, public health, you know, or the government groups or pressure groups or whoever these people are that is creating this hysteria, do they have currently right now any long term studies underway, funded and planned with control groups? Well, the only the only study I know that is uh, that's a quite large study which looks at biomarkers among other things is the PATH study that is in the in the going on in the U.S. at the moment. Um, I'm sure there might be other studies that I'm not aware of, um, but the the best way I think to actually estimate whether there is an impact. Uh, long-term health impact is to look at registration data. For instance, I would suggest that one would look, what one could do is look at the prevalence of e-cigarette at population level and try to associate it with changes, controlling for other influences, the changes in the incidence of particular diseases, which would be one way of addressing the question. But as I said, uh, you know, this, these, these, these statements, for instance, that Public Health England has made uh, or other or the Royal College of Physicians, that uh, e-cigarettes are magnitudes of order safer than cigarettes is not these don't come out of a vacuum of knowledge, right? We have we have decades and decades of research on the dangers of cigarettes, and based on the research, we can be quite confident that we know that people who use e-cigarettes are exposed to much lower levels of harmful substances. And so therefore, everything else being equal, you would assume they are much less likely to develop diseases subsequently. Okay, so Dr. Shahab, on that note, let's bring right back to basically the theme of this piece is that the foundational science that is on side of vaping when it comes to tool for harm reduction is under attack. And it's the, it's the, it's the real play here that's going on. I'm going to play you a piece uh, which was from the House Oversight Committee in the U.S. Um, and then I'll watch your reaction. 
In 2018, the UK's Royal College of Physicians published a comprehensive scientific report which concluded that vaping nicotine can eliminate almost all the harm from smoking cigarettes and recommended promoting the use of e-cigarettes to smokers as widely as possible. The report also indicated that vaping nicotine is at least 95% less harmful than smoking. Public Health England concurs. Even the American Cancer Society is beginning to understand the promise of tobacco harm reduction, stating that e-cigarettes are, quote, likely to be significantly less harmful for adults than smoking regular cigarettes, and they encourage adults who have failed other FDA-approved methods to switch to e-cigarettes. Thank you, Ms. Porter. I need to correct the record on a couple things that were just said. There is no evidence to suggest that e-cigarettes are safe or even safer than cigarettes. That's why the FDA just released their regulations uh, directed at Juul. Secondly, the CDC just came in and presented evidence that they don't know the cause of uh, the current outbreak and did not rule out nicotine e-cigarettes. May I respond? No. What I wanted to say was um, with regard to, to the chairman's comments that there's no evidence that e-cigarettes are less harmful. That's just simply not true. It, is, it was a comprehensive scientific report that was generated by the United Kingdom's Royal College of Physicians. It wasn't just an opinion. It wasn't anecdotal, as it were. It was actually a scientific report. Also, um, and I'm not sure how many people had a chance to see this on CBS This Morning last week, Dr. David Abrams from the NYU College of Global Public Health indicated that abundant evidence exists that the cancer biomarkers associated with e-cigarettes are vastly lower than the ones that are associated with smoking. I would also like to ask uh, if somebody could please answer me this particular question. What is the particular um, mechanism by which PG and VG could possibly cause disease? Dr. Rizzo, could you care to respond to the claim that e-cigarettes are safer than combustible cigarettes? Yes, the, the quote about the United Kingdom's decision that 95% safer than um, tobacco. If you read the articles about how that decision was made, a group of experts got together for two days in Europe. Several of those experts admitted to be working for the vaping industry. And the European Respiratory Society, the Lancet Editorial, and 14 professional societies in this country wrote letters to the United Kingdom saying they don't agree with that public health decision. And also in the United Kingdom, there's a much different aspect of e-cigarettes. They're controlled and regulated much more strictly than this country. The tobacco flavors are not the flavors are not there. So you really can't compare what happens in England to this country, and it really is faulty science that it was based on. So, uh, my friend, what do you think? Well, that's quite shocking, <laughs> I would say. I mean, there are various misleading statements being made uh, by people, including, for instance, the claim, which I don't know, is being reiterated, that the the evidence uh, to support the 95% reduction is based on uh, on a Delphi exercise, which is basically having experts come together. As I just mentioned, uh, there is a study uh, um, which is well cited in a journal called Tobacco Control, which has looked at the potential of e-cigarettes to cause cancer, estimating on quite scientifically sound methodology, estimating it to be 1% of that of a cigarette. Our study, which was conducted in long-term users, shows the exposure to these harmful substances is reduced by 95% or thereabouts. Um, so it is clearly not true to say there's no uh, previous evidence to support the claim that e-cigarettes are safer or less harmful than than smoking. Quite beside the point, as I already mentioned, is that there's no combustion going on. So it's not bogus science, then? It's not bogus science to say they are uh, less harmful, no. <laughs> Truth, insofar uh, as it exists in this context, uh, doesn't care about how it's spun. So the consequence may very well be that e-cigarette use decreases and that smoking rates start to increase again. Uh, and the one question I always ask myself is, you know, who benefits from having stories that uh, that seem to suggest that e-cigarettes are as harmful, which you know is not the case, as harmful as cigarettes? Who benefits from it? Uh, there's at least one industry that benefits from a reduction in the use of e-cigarettes, which is the uh, industry that um, that produces the other product that is available, which is tobacco. So I'm intrigued to see how this uh, plays out in the long run. I'm afraid to say uh, from an epidemiological viewpoint, it would be uh, probably quite informative if suddenly e-cigarette rates decrease and smoking rates increase again. And then we can see, have a look at the associations long term with health. But I hope that doesn't uh, come to pass, as it were. I hope that people keep cool heads and uh, look at the uh, hard facts and science that is available already, which does show quite convincingly, I think, that e-cigarettes are 
much less harmful than cigarettes.